guest is uh, Dr. Mohamed Enayat, known as uh, Dr. E. He's a visionary uh, TEDx speaker and a true innovator in the world of healthcare. Dr. E is on a mission to explore new frontiers of medicine. He's determined to bring the latest and most life improving techniques into the human healthcare system. His main uh, objective to discover and turn back the aging process, both in our bodies and in the way we think about health. Hello, Dr. E. Hi, Rose. How are you? <laughs> nice. I'm happy to have you with us here in the harvest uh, happening in London for the first time. Uh, so, we're going to talk about uh, your philosophy and uh, your mission in transforming healthcare and why you make uh, this interesting analogy between the human body and the cars. <laughs> yes. Um, have you seen Knight Rider? Do you remember Knight Rider? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you remember Knight Rider, right? <laughs> yeah, very well. Um, when I did my TED talk, they didn't know, uh, so I did it at university and it was quite funny because the audience were really quite young. So okay. I, put, I put the analogy. I'm not that young. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm old we, enough to know that. <laughs> we aren't, right? And uh, I put the analogy of the human body being like Knight Rider, where you have a self-driving car, and David Hasselhoff is our consciousness, consciousness wanting to drive the vehicle. And I put the slide up and said, who recognizes <laughs> this? This is Knight Rider. And I think one person in the audience put their hand up. So that's quite a, car, a young black car that can drive uh, itself. That's a black yeah. car that can drive itself. Yeah. And talk, actually. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And a bit like that, our human body is a self-driving car. It's a set of systems and processes that, um, that drives itself. It's like when we're asleep, there's tons of processes going on to self-heal, self-regulate, boost our healthy immune response, produce natural killer cells to fight against cancerous changes that are going on all the time. Uh, as just one of the examples. Yeah. And, um, and then when we wake up, we have our consciousness, the driver, saying, I want to take my car to work. I want to take my car to be the best dad, to be the best son, employee, etc. Um, and sometimes they can be alignment and sometimes they can be misalignment. And the, the self-driving car just won't allow you to get there. And so for me, um, health is the ability to do what you like to do with your body and engineering that state of health where it's no longer in your way, but it's working for you to get the most out of life, out of driving that car okay. towards the destination you want to go. Yeah. So longevity is really, give more longevity to people is uh, your goal through health. It's about quality of life. It really yeah. comes down to quality of life. And it's about giving people the best quality of life for as long as possible. Okay. And the tools are, uh, what are the tools to get that? Well, it starts with a data dive, really understanding your own biology, um, going deeper, treating you as an individual, not as a regression of a curve, which is yeah, basically okay. you know, the wider yeah. population, which has really wide normal ranges around biomarkers. But looking for your optimal ranges within your biology and your biological systems, getting them working well together, um, will improve your state of health, better energy, better focus, stronger immunity, better sleep, better digestion. And all of these are your building blocks to then go and drive the car where you want it to go. Okay. Yeah. So um, you have, um, how is it different, uh, your approach, from the um, traditional uh, healthcare well, I'm a, system? Well, I'm a, yeah, so I'm a UK trained GP. I still work within the, national, the NHS uh, part time. And I soon realized that traditional healthcare, the way we're taught it, the way the algorithms of care are created is really about sickness care. It's about keeping, not keeping you sick, but diagnosing the sickness according to very old 1980s, 1970s classification of disease. Um, and then maintaining you in that state for as long as possible. Okay. I'm not intentionally maintaining you, but trying to stop deterioration. Yeah. And the tools that are available in traditional medicine are drugs and surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're not doing very well is identifying the processes that lead to that state of disease in the first place and looking sooner and intervening earlier. The interventions, when you look, when you start to look earlier, uh, the interventions are a lot easier, a lot safer, less riskier, less toxic, less costly, um, and more impactful. So when I started to realize this, it really changed my whole philosophy of how I should be a doctor. 
it changed my definition of what health is. It's, for me, it's an absolute state of vitality that can be engineered um, and not just simply an absence of disease. And they're very, very different. Um, so you created this uh, lab uh, in, uh, in London and uh, what's happening with your uh, patients? What's the first thing you do uh, to them when they enter uh, to your place? The first thing we do is we discover them, we learn about them. And we, le we, we ask the one question that doesn't get asked in healthcare, why? So in healthcare, when you get a problem, we don't ask why. And that actually just struck me as I was driving down here today. Um, if, you go in, if you go to your doctor and you have some symptoms, they're, they're not going to spend, but they're not going to ask you why. They get the, the, the biomarkers, they diagnose a disease, but they're not asking why you got that disease. They're not looking for the drivers of that disease. Okay. Right? Can you give me an example of someone where you say why and you get like a very interesting answer that could help you? Yeah, so our starting point is why because we want to know why they're here in the first place, where, how they're looking to drive their car, what are they looking to achieve in life, why is their health so important to them right now. Um, and understanding their why is very powerful. Um, but then that why continues through our philosophy and the way we work with our patients um, f by looking for the root cause of any imbalances that may be presenting in symptoms that they may be having. Brain fog, bloating, uh, agitation, anxiety, restlessness, uh, overthinking, poor sleep, insomnia, the whole range of imbalances. Yeah. Rather than um, just waiting and saying, well, you've got prediabetes, take metformin. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You've got high blood pressure, take antihypertensive. You've got cholesterol, you're above 40, you need to be on this medication for the rest of your life. So what kind of tests uh, do you do to the patients? Okay, so we, we take our patients through a testing journey, but um, we've realized that we start with a panel of tests that's 100 biomarkers that represents the key important foundations of your health, the key important biological systems of your health. And we look at them um, in a very optimal range perspective, functionally, um, and by doing that, we're able to identify imbalances. We're not looking them at, them, uh, at a wide, wide normal range perspective, okay, looking okay. for disease. We're looking for imbalance. We can, we can obviously diagnose disease because we're physician-led. Uh, we're a team of physicians that work alongside health practitioners. Um, and that's a really great starting point. Those, those 100 biomarkers, we look at your, your hematology. We look at your immune system. Uh, we look at your hormone balance. Your hormones is a balance. They're, yeah. they're your thermostats that control your mood, libido, yeah. um, energy as well. We look at your micronutrients, the key important nutrients. Um, we look at your metabolism, your blood sugar response, your insulin resistance, your lipidology, how you take fats and create uh, cholesterol. Um, and alongside that, your kind of liver health, kidney health, um, etc. cetera. Um, and that really gives us an, a really good understanding of how the human operating system for you is working, how yeah. efficiently it's working. And what do you notice, like uh, most of your patients usually, what's happening, uh, what do you notice that they, they didn't know before? Um, do you know what's interesting? It's a very good question because when you go to your doctor and you don't have a disease and you do a, a health profile, m the majority of times they'll say to you everything's normal. There has not been one patient of the 2,000 plus patients we've seen where we say we haven't found an imbalance. We okay. tend to find at least five imbalances or more that we're seeking to treat strategically over time. So once we've identified the imbalances, that you then work with a dedicated functional nutritionist who's your health coach through the journey, overseen by the strategists, the doctors um, who are trained in personalized medicine um, to create the strategy with you. Um, and then we follow you on a journey. We correct those imbalances through prescription supplementation, uh, prescribing supplements, um, correcting those imbalances one by one, yeah. um, and uh, nutrition and lifestyle strategies. We can prescribe medications if required, and we can, and we do integrate with the traditional medical system. So if we need to refer you on for more for more imaging, or we find something that we want to investigate further with traditional secondary care we engage with traditional secondary care. So it's a very powerful methodology um, that sits alongside traditional medicine. I've yet to come to the, the, the clinic because all of this is delivered remotely for our patients. Okay. Yeah. We work with patients now around the country and around the world um, uh, where we can work with them completely remotely 
um, send drop ship their supplements out to them and work and work with them uh, in the comfort of their own home or office um, but so for how those can they be tested how can they be tested uh, we w work with local labs okay um, but the the magic really is in the interpretation right um, it's it's in how we're looking and what we're looking for within your biomarkers and you know that's 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 really important to understand uh, because if you're looking for disease it's a very kind of regression of a curve easy to do you know wide normal ranges but when you're looking for fine-tuning the human engine yeah you need to have the right training and experience um, applying that um, and then we have a center in London where we have curated a suite of technologies that based on a real deep understanding of how the human body works and the biological systems and what they require to work better we've curated a suite of technologies there that we prescribe to our patients according to their budget timeline availability and goals Okay. okay, do you have examples of these uh, technologies? Yeah. Absolutely. I was the first doctor in the UK to get a to make a custom made hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah. So that's very 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 cold. Yeah, so that was no no, that's a high pressure oxygen therapy. Ah, okay. Yeah, so you go inside a chamber a chamber, it becomes pressurized and you you receive oxygen at the same okay. time. Okay. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, that increases your ability to retain oxygen and carry oxygen by 20 times. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so the, the impact of that, the mechanisms of action of that uh, increases stem cell production from our bone marrow. Where this, we have to appreciate that the human body is a, is a biological organism um, that is self-replicating and self-organizing. It's trillions of cells that are self-replicating, you know, self-organizing self into specialist systems and organs and tissues. And it's really pre-programmed to deteriorate and the peak of its operation, physiological operation, is in its mid to late 20s. And then we're on a steady, steady decline. And one of okay. the things that steadily declines is our ability to replete stem cells, to create yeah. new baby yes. stem cells. Yeah. Okay. And this is why intermittent fasting has become so popular, because intermittent fasting works at the other end. It helps to remove aging stem cells. Yeah. Okay. okay? A process called autophagy, autophagy, self-cleaning. The, the dying cells, because when they stick around for longer, they, they're actually more pro-inflammatory. Okay. okay, okay. So autophagy is fantastic, Inter intermittent fa uh, fasting is fantastic, and that seems to create space for new stem cells to grow. But still, the rate of stem cell production decreases. Having worked in the stem cell industry 2007, that's when my eyes opened to the idea and the understanding of how the human body uh, slowly deteriorates over time. What are the mm. systems and processes that stop working as efficiently? And therefore, I curated technologies that would support some of those processes that slow down to make yeah. them work better. And one of them is stem cell production. The other thing I really like about hyperbaric oxygen is that it stimulates the production of vascular endothelial growth factor or certain growth factors. Now, VEGF is a really powerful uh, growth factor that stimulates new blood vessels to be created. Now what happens as we get older? Our organs shrink. Why? Because there's micro clots in the finer capillaries. Mm, and why okay. is that? Because there's calcification, and that's the traditional medicine approach to understanding lipidology and becoming um, oxidized LDL, oxidation and oxidative stress applied to that LDL cholesterol, causing calcification, stiffening of the, of the large vessels, that cause heart attacks and strokes, but that happens in the smaller vessels as well, tiny vessels first, and that's why organs shrink. So if we can keep blood supply open, the plumbing, delivering our nutrients, oxygen, and the key micronutrients from our efficient digestive tract, we'll talk about that in a second, then we, then we keep our organs and our tissues working well, our cells working well. So I love hyperbaric medicine. I, re okay. I remortgaged my parents' house to buy that chamber. No, really. Well, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, I really strongly believe in the potential of upregulating processes that slow down. This is seven years ago. So hyperbaric medicine for me, I love. So now the house is safe? Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask my parents. <laughs> okay. No, but you know, we're constantly reinvesting in growing and, and, sh and sharing and impacting more people, okay, with, with human. Yeah, so the investing in uh, new technologies is like uh, very important researching how do you keep up with the latest uh, data and check 
at their work. Absolutely, yeah. So um, we have a medical advisory board of experts from around the world. Okay. And uh, we look at emerging technologies. We make sure that they are safe. Well, firstly, we understand the science. They fit into our scientific understanding of how the human best, uh, body operates. Then we look at the technologies. We see how they're applied in disease state and the mechanisms of how they're, if they work in disease. So, for example, hyperbaric medicine is used to treat uh, after strokes because it helps the tissue reperfuse okay. re and after heart attacks to help the, 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 the heart reperfuse. And, and thus we apply it to our understanding of the things that deteriorate as before we get that disease. Okay, okay. So, so it's through a strong understanding of how the human body best operates, which is a combination of really understanding longevity medicine, what slows down as we get older, and functional medicine which okay. is looking at the past, really. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting. We're yeah. at that sweet spot of understanding the science of what's happened to get you to that place. That's functional medicine. Why have you got this problem in the first place? It's fantastic for that. And what happens to you as you get older over time? Yeah. And that, that brings you to what human is really good for. What we're really good for is the present moment. Okay. Optimizing you to feel the best you can in the moment. So how long do you, are you planning to make people live? Um, uh, I, haven't really th I haven't really thought about that as... Um, in good health, in good yeah, health, I mean, yeah. I think, re I think realistically the starting point dictates the ending point. And the starting point of where you're at will dictate how much you reversal you can get. Yeah, okay. So some of my favorite patients to work with are the 25, 30 year olds that we're working with. And even younger, some elite athletes that we're working with, uh, professional athletes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. boxers, um, fighters, racing drivers. Um, they, they, they really excite me working with them because I get to then see the impact of working um, in, with a very controlled environment. And we've taken the learnings from that and applying them to everyday people. So I think the younger you start, the more peak performance you'll get and the longer that will last for in this philosophy of approaching the human body. Interestingly, our average page, uh, age of our patients is about 38. So okay. fairly young to engage with the healthcare yes, system. Yeah, completely. Yeah, okay. fairly young. And, um, um, but they're often referring on their moms and dads and aunts and uncles to us once they start to see the results that they get. Um, the How long does it take to take results with you? Two weeks. Two weeks, oh, okay, yeah, wow. Yeah, we start to feel, okay. feel improvement. We've audited our results and we see a 43% improvement in people's symptoms within eight weeks. Okay. Yeah, a global symptoms. We do a global symptom scoring, which looks at your, your whole health systems and how you feel, even not just things that you're reporting. Um, it's, a, it's a score out of 100, a medical, and it's a validated scoring scale, and we see a 42% improvement when you work with us on a health program within, and we test it at, at eight, eight weeks. But people start to see a noticeable difference within two weeks. Sometimes okay. within two hours, it depends if they're in the clinic doing a therapy. When you're doing a therapy, you get a very quick result, yeah. Okay. Uh, particularly around energy, brain fog, um, resilience, stress there's there's a lot of benefits of doing some of the therapies that we offer okay uh other therapies i guess the cold the cold one the very cryotherapy, cold one. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic so cryotherapy is great for but both for longevity and also for the short term i love it because it helps people get out of their um get out of their head you know when you're going to an extremely cold environment you suddenly get into your body and i think we the more you practice that the better you get at it you know and i think we need to learn that skill of uh, getting out of our head. There's a lot of overthinking going on across society. And I think we're biologically wi hardwiring ourselves. Our environment is hardwiring ourselves to become very short attention span, um, you know, through social media, yeah. through engaging with digital yeah. technologies. And we're seeing that in the NHS, you know, in now at the public health level, I'm seeing that younger and younger people are coming with anxiety, Te teens, yeah, 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 yeah. teens. I mean, you think yourself, how many people do you know that have suffered or are suffering with a form of anxiety? Yeah, yeah, it's crippling. Yeah, yeah. And anxiety really is crippling. But anxiety is a nervous system issue and it's a hardwiring of your brain. And that's happening by the way we engage with our environment. Yeah. Really, particularly technology. So, and what so do you do for uh, anxious so people? Yeah. Yeah, what do we do? Well, um, we help them. Cryotherapy is great for it because if you do that regularly, you learn how to get out of your head. You learn okay. how to breathe. Okay. Yeah. You learn how to control your stress response. You learn how to identify your stress response. 
So you, then you can intervene earlier when you start to go down a stress response in okay. anxiety. The human body is, is, is amazing. You know, it, uh, it, it perfects what you practice, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. And anxiety, you get better at it because you're subconsciously practicing it more and more. So the key to anxiety is practicing state awareness, you know, understanding, being in your body, learning, feeling, sensing, and then practicing that, identifying when you're moving away from your calm state, because that will eventually lead to your anxious state. And when you start to move away, you then employ the tools, the breathing, the movement, the sunlight, the nature, um, to, to, uh, to your advantage. Yeah. Are you incorporating like uh, practices like meditation uh, to this uh, very advanced uh, technology? Uh, absolutely, meditation is. We don't we don't teach it ourselves, but we have a network of practitioners. We strongly recommend it in our health programs, depending it depending on the person. Um, yeah, things that slow slow down are very important. Things you know, teaching people to slow down and and be okay with slowing down is really really important because we're in an overactive state consistently, generally within the population. So we need to learn how to slow down. You know, going back 20 years, we didn't have our phones and emails and WhatsApps and social media driving a nervous system response at 10 p.m. at night, at 9 p.m. at night. Okay, and now we do. And so we're not getting into the restorative healing phases, the parasympathetic, where all the magic happens, you know, the, the magic to self-heal. When I started right in the earlier discussion, I talked about natural killer cells. Offline, we were talking about the rise of cancer. Natural killer cells are produced by us, by us and in our deep sleep okay. to kill off cancerous changes that happen all the time within our cells. If we're not getting into our deep restorative sleep because we have these pulses, biological pulses stimulated by our environment all the time, right? by engaging with social media, blue light, and then also yeah. just not just social media, WhatsApp, emails, Apple Watch notifications, constant notifications keep us alert, mm -hmm. okay? And so we don't get the deep sleep. When we don't get the deep sleep, we don't get the natural response to fighting cancer yeah, okay. or help restoring a healthy immune system. This is why we see in the West such high inflammation within our society because inflammation is a disbalance. It's an imbalance between a healthy immune response and an unhealthy immune response. There's a rise in autoimmune conditions because okay. of that, so it contributes to that. What do you say to people? Um, are you trying to convince them? Because you always have like some uh, skeptical people who say we're going to die anyway, so why not enjoy life and uh, drink wine, smoke cigarettes, and uh, party? Or because anyway, we're going to die. What do you tell them? I mean, is and I don't want to uh, be obsessed with health. Look, look you I know, I enjoy I, life. Yeah, I mean, is enjoying life? Is that enjoying life? I don't know. Is if that is enjoying life to them, then you know everyone's free to enjoy life in the way they want to enjoy life. But if enjoyment of life is something else, where you're, where you understand the implications of these things and the negative effects of these things, um, and you can choose to have them when you want, but you're not dependent on them to enjoy your life. That's that to me is control. That to me is what I want my patients and my community and our community, with including our harvest community, to be able to experience, you know, that self-control, that autonomy, that giving them the tools to be able to navigate their life because life is up and down. There are inevitable difficulties in life that will come. And we, we need to be choosing and being equipped with healthy tools and ways out of those difficult, uh, difficult times and know when we need to know how to restore or the other side know how to ramp up when we want to ramp up like I you know we teach our athletes you you know how do you kind of perform at the peak time for your event you know there's, yeah. there's 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 techniques and strategies that can be deployed for that how have you what's your routine what have you changed like from um before like have you always been like into health no I wouldn't say I was ever particularly unhealthy. I was. Um, I, I, I used to be quite athletic, and I love playing sports a lot. Um, and um, I think now I live a very kind of. I have the tools, and I deploy those tools as required, and so I can sustain longer periods of high performance. What I regard okay. as high performance. Yeah. So I can. I can, and I can stick, and I can create longer periods of flow state. 
Okay. Staying in, a, in for me, it's an average of a mean rather than having these wild swings. Okay. Um, and so, for, how know, do you get them? These flow states. It, it's uh, it's it's a state that um, that you practice over time by learning when you're moving away into a stressed response and yeah. when you when you're moving away into you know into a depleted state where you're really struggling you know energetically. Okay. Yeah. And then and then practicing um, the environmental modifications that you need. Um, so sleep, nutrition, movement, community, purpose, value, missions, all of those are the, the environmental tools, things we can modify in our environment. And when I need some love, I can go to my nieces and nephews, and do you know what I mean? Or when okay. I need to get some purpose, well, I feel like, you know, human is very purposeful. It's a mission-driven company, and I attach a lot, a lot of purpose to that, so which is great, and it helps me a lot. Um, but when I'm feeling a bit depleted, I know that I need to take my supplements regularly and... You know, I've got, I'm very lucky and fortunate to have um, access to some of the therapies. Today, in preparation for this, I, I did the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Okay. I took some NAD plus intravenously, and, um, and it's helped me, uh, it's helping me right now. Okay. Retain focus, attention, hopefully be with you and, <laughs> and, 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 and give yeah, you my yeah, best. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And IV, you do a lot of uh, IV to people? Um, yes, it's a tool that we use. Yeah. Now, what, what, what we need to understand is that we're, we're depleted in our environment of good quality raw material, okay? Yeah. As we know this, our soil is deplete, which means our food is deplete. And the soil is depleted through kind of industrialization of the food chain process, glyphosates, herbicides, pesticides, hormone, hormones, synthetic hormones injected into the, 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 the meat chain as well. Um, and so the food that we eat is deplete of the key raw material. The other side of it is that those toxins that we ingest also disrupt our ability to take out good the raw material. So yeah. affect our intestinal wall lining, which, may, which, may, which means that we don't absorb the key micronutrients well. We don't break down our food well. In fact, we do the inverse. We see a lot of inflammation driven through an activation of our immune system driven through our gut wall. Okay, so... Um, Supplementation is very important in, in the modern age to be able to support the systems yeah. um, to work most efficiently. And we're seeing that a lot. We're seeing a lot of detoxification issues, overwhelmed detoxification. How does that manifest? In hormone uh, disruption. Mm. Okay, so yeah. we're seeing more and more estrogen dominance, both in men and women, which is um, uh, higher levels of estrogen within uh, basically high levels of estrogen than we should have for optimal function. Okay. Which affects our mood. What which are affects, the consequences? Yeah, yeah which can mood? affect our mood for women, PMS, heavy early periods, polycystic ovaries, um, are just some of the um, more sustained symptoms of perimenopause, uh, which are more disruptive. Those are just some of the... Uh, and then for men, also becoming... Um, uh, having more increased emotional lability, physical signs and symptoms through gynecomastia as well, decreasing testosterone for men, just some of the examples of okay. having poor detoxification processes. But alongside the hormonal side of de detoxification is a rising amount of you know, not clearing those toxins and those toxins driving inflammatory processes. Now, if I the, a lot of detoxification happens in the liver. We're seeing a remarkable amount of fatty liver disease. So yeah. liver cellular processes not working efficiently, they can be if you're given the raw material they require, for example, cruciferous vegetables or contain an ingredient called DIM, DIM is very good for helping recycling our hormones. That's just a simple example. So we can support those cellular processes to work better through targeted supplementation mm -hmm. if we've identified you have a problem there. Okay. Yeah. And the supplements in general for people who are not uh, being tested, what kind of supplements should uh, you would say like should everybody get like and it's not dangerous but yeah. uh, they should have it like for breakfast or dinner? Okay, I think the, f the starting point is understanding. Look at your supplements. Make sure that they're high quality. Okay. And they're not part of the problem. Okay. Right? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've heard of Centrum. Centrum, nope. the brand. No. Nope. So it was uh, when I last checked, it was the number one most sold multivitamin. Okay. It comes in a solid capsule form. Why is it solid? It's because it's got known fillers and additives in it to keep all of the raw materials together, which are some of which are carcinogenic. So it's an example of a mass processed supplements okay. driving the problem, not fixing wow. the underlying problem. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I say when you look at supplements, make sure that they, they are non-GMO, they're 
the all the things that you're looking for food look for the supplements as well that they're yeah. they're, they're made in a high quality uh, place um, we manufacture ours in a medical grade facilities um, in in the US and they're compounded supplements which means that they're compounded with lots of ingredients that support a specific system that we're looking to support um, for everyday people I think what you need to be thinking about is long-term brain health the omega, omega fish oils or omega Okay. Uh, omega fatty acids, um, th because we're short of that in our society. But Think it doesn't give like reflux. Omega doesn't give uh, reflux. No. 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 Okay. We need. We're we're short of. Um, uh, short. We're short of uh, omega three fatty acids within our society. We we have a lot of uh, omega six within our foods, which are pro-inflammatory. So we need to balance okay. those out, um, and they're they're known to be cardio protective, protective of the heart, and protective of the brain the cells of the okay. brain. Remember, each of our cells are surrounded by fat. Okay, so they're surrounded by a, a cell wall that's predominantly consisted of fat. And we want healthy fats in the cell wall, not unhealthy fats. Mm -hmm. So okay. the omegas are actually really, really important, particularly after 35, 40. Okay, okay? interesting. Um, we want a healthy microbiome. We talk about probiotics. Yeah. Um, so try and vary your probiotics, or you can, you, can, you, you, can, you can do that through your diet as well by having a high amount of uh, prebiotic foods that will create the environment for probiotics as well. Um, protein, we're very short of protein. Okay, Structural integrity of the body, of our cells, of our tissue, come from a good amount of protein. Um, but a lot of people have whey protein. Whey protein can be very pro-inflammatory because we just the human body um, uh, is adaptive and the more we're exposed to something, the more we become sensitive to it. Okay, yeah. so remember the TV adverts of drink your milk <laughs> yeah. yeah and we all grew up on cow's milk yeah. yeah and now we know the pasteurization and all the processes and the cows the rearing of the cows is really unhealthy so this is why we see a lot of dairy so sensitivity too much milk is bad. Yeah. yeah 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 well this is why we see dairy sensitivity so you take okay. breaks um, and um, and so yeah the other thing that we see a lot of is gluten sensitivity yeah because we have a lot of gluten in our diet breads um, etc., pastas, etc., you know, re refined and processed uh, wheat. Um, so, all this you suggest that we have a break and then reincorporate. Yeah, it and then be sensitive to it. Like, you know, see how you feel. See if you get any symptoms of bloating, brain fog, rashes, um, joint aches. Yeah. All of these non specific symptoms, you know, just be sensitive. Be aware of your body and really kind of learn to be more sensitive of how you're feeling across your body. Um, and definitely coming back to you, just reiterate, control your thoughts, you know, don't let your thoughts control you. And that's very hard. Yeah. Um, but thought control um, is really, really important, you know, and um, in this day and age. So we talked about uh, uh, omega threes, I really think are important. Yeah. We talked about um, protein. Yeah. Probiotics um, cycling. Um, you can be on and off probiotics. That's absolutely fine. But go on to them after antibiotic use. Go on, go and use probiotics if you start to get any bloating or any digestive symptoms. If you take probiotics and your bloating gets worse, go see a doctor because that could be a sign of really uh, dysbiotic or imbalanced uh, uh, bac uh, bacteria within your stomach, um, which would need to be treated. Okay. Um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, and we're talking about protein and we went on to talk about whey, but I really like um, collagen peptide protein. So okay. um, coming from either from animal sources, you can get plant based proteins as well, um, which are very rich in protein and easily absorbed. And, and, and uh, that's that's important. So think about protein. Um, what else is kind of a maintenance? We're seeing a large amount of vitamin D deficiency um, and within suboptimal ranges. Now, vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone. It's a precursor to our, our hormones. So it's important that we keep yeah. our vitamin D okay. nice and high, not just uh, within normal, but I like to keep them um, in a higher range. Um, I think those, those, are a really good, those are a really good starting point. Um, we're seeing a lot of magnesium deficiency as well. Yeah. Um, and magnesium is quite nice in the evenings to help you get restful, um, which um, as we discovered, we, we all need that in, in kind of urban societies, particularly. Um, I think those are the kind of bread and butter. Um, but ideally, test. Don't just guess. If yes, you can exactly. afford to test, yeah. go for it. You know, test, but test with not just, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of direct-to-consumer testing nowadays, and you're left to self-interpret. 
you know, go to go to go to some expertise. You can look at that, make sense of it. Look at how those systems are working together, and really give you a proper strategy to get you results quicker, if possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, why is um, brain health important in the um, latest um, stages of life? And what do you do to keep your brain safe? What, uh, so, the so basic it, stuff and the more sophisticated stuff. Yeah, so b basic stuff, I mean, uh, we talked about kind of having um, a healthy, uh, healthy fats in your diet are very, very important for, for brain health. Exercise is remarkably important for brain health. We haven't really oh, talked. brain. Yeah, really, really okay. important. Blood flow to the brain is really, really important. Um, and uh, low intensity, steady state exercise, particularly zone two exercise, we call it, where your heart rate's not going above 120, 130, it varies per person. Okay. But you know, like brisk walking, or light jogging, depending what, what you can um, tolerate. Um, that's that's really important. I, I recommend, my, recommend my patients to try and think about breaking sweat two or three times a week. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good barometer of, of getting beyond their lists. But, yeah. And then the rest of the time being doing lists. You know, okay. An hour of lists a day will be fantastic for kind of long-term brain health. Um, rest, sleep, restorative rest is very, very important. Switching off digital detox, you need to go through periods of under-stimulating the brain. And that, that you know, think about, think about your, your use of a car. You know, if you drive your car in a, in, um, in, a, in a tough environment where it's snowing, it's raining, it's difficult, the car will, you know, have more wear and tear to it. Whereas if you protect the environment a little bit from time to time and you kind of reduce the stimulation, you're going to give the brain a bit more time to kind of uh, restore um, and underwork, which is okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's not all about just overworking, it's about underworking as well. And creating a nice environment for sleep, you know, getting deep restorative sleep. I think um, the other side of um, brain health is, we, we talk about state management a lot, but trying not to uh, get caught up in um, reserving that, that kind of, that state when you're, when you're over ramped up. You know, when you get angry or irritable yeah, yeah. or notice that and pay yourself back, you know, start to understand that your biology is also driving that. Mm -hmm. And there's ways for that, that you can deploy, as we talked about earlier, to kind oh, of yes. bring that back and find that stead steady state, you know, steady wins the race. Um, slow and steady wins the race, I think. Yeah. Do you have an example of a few examples of people you really helped uh, that were not aware what they would they were going to find and uh, that yeah, you many managed to help. Yeah, many examples and um, uh, many testimonials you'll find. Of, uh, we've been very blessed to, have work, to work with a whole variety of patients. Uh, one of the patients that come with to us because they're struggling with a medical condition that they want an alternative route to try and understand why. Um, autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, cancer patients that we continue with traditional care but we support them nutritionally and making the lifestyle modifications. And then in between, people that are not getting the answers from the healthcare system. Um, and that, I, I feel like women are underserved and women come to mind. And one of the patients that comes to mind is, and she's happy for me to talk about it, is Emma Hayes. Emma Hayes for me is the Sir Alex Ferguson of female football. She's the most decorated female in football. She's the okay. manager of Chelsea Women's Football Club. Um, and she came to me a couple of years ago at the point of burnout. Um, off season and she was um, at the point of she just given birth she had a young child um, and she openly talks about this um, that she was considering leaving her the, the career that she really yeah. loved because she was she felt absolutely exhausted. fatigued yeah. exhausted right, right. and she she had access to the best doctors but they couldn't get to the bottom of it and support her through it and that was working with her over a period of two months and then we sustained the relationship ongoing but intense two months was really rewarding you know supporting her with her digestion and it's not complicated optimizing nutrient delivery detoxification came up as an issue for her it's very common in in our environment currently um, helping her get into a restorative healing state yeah. using the therapies like hyperbaric um, nad cryotherapy in a strategic way allowed her to get back to a point where she was ready for the season again and mm. now she's been Great. You know, okay. doing her thing for the for a couple of consecutive years another gentleman i recently worked with and you know it was published in the times uh, because it was quite a breakthrough um 
was a, a boxer called Conor Ben. Um, he is the son of a famous British boxer called Nigel Ben, okay. and he was due to have uh, the biggest fight of his career with uh, the son of uh, Chris Eubank, who was a who who was another major British fighter. Okay. So Chris, sorry, Eubank, I don't know them. Yeah, but I no, trust I can see you from, on this I can one. See, I can see from your face, <laughs> but yeah, Chris, Chris Eubank and Nigel Ben yeah. were rivals. Okay. In the eighties and nineties. Okay. Their sons, it's never really happened before. Their sons, at their similar age. Oh, that's and wonderful. And they could fight okay. together. They, okay. they, and they were planning a fight. So a little bit of pressure. Yeah, yeah. a lot of pressure. And um, it was a big monumental fight. And um, just two weeks before the fight, it got cancelled because Conor Ben was found positive for clomiphene in his urine or breakdown products of a specific type of hormone that they thought he doped with okay. in his urine. Um, he was introduced to me a few months later, six months later in March. He was very low, very depressed, very, you know, just had hit the real lows of taking his, his career taken away. He'd been out saying, look, it wasn't me, I haven't done anything. Um, but obviously he was falling on deaf ears and the biggest thing, biggest fight he was building up to, they'd been taken away. But beyond that, everything he'd been working for had been taken away. Yeah, yeah. He'd been Including considering suicide okay. and et cetera, oh. yeah. And he came to me just for a wellness. He got introduced to me just for wellness. And uh, we did the first baseline test that we do with everyone, 100 biomarkers. And lo and behold, we found a pattern of estrogen dominance. That led me to do some further di uh, diving. It raised my suspicion that he had a problem in his liver to remove hormones. Okay. Okay. And um, we did some uh, uh, detox gene testing. We found that he had a double mutation in the gene responsible for removing clomiphene the particular drug that he was found positive for. And interestingly enough, at that time during COVID, there was a big import of eggs from Europe, which in, in the food chain, the chickens are injected with clomiphene. Oh, okay. Okay, so Interesting. Uh, um, because there was an egg shortage here. So he, we then went further, we found scientific experts in the field of doping. And we were able to establish that the breakdown products found in his urine from his drug testing, because we had the reports, were consistent of two-pass metabolism. So going through the uh, going through the chicken and then going through the egg, oh, not so one you pass. Prove that so we proved oh, he was innocent. Amazing. Okay. And he's now actually fighting tomorrow. No way. For the first time <laughs> in America. Okay. Yeah. So he comes. To, he comes to mind. But this is the biological detective work that we're able to do to help people unravel where they've got to but i mean this has a whole new implication and i was i, I was fortunate to get an open, open editorial in the back page of the times because it's it's big for sports um because yeah. we should be looking at people's uh, well, athletes particularly we should be looking at their urine not in isolation of their biology we should be looking at how their biological processes work and we vary from person to person okay right so i process hormone differently so you process hormone so let's Let's use that and understand that when we're analyzing the urine sample. Okay. With Olympics coming up as well in Paris next year, um, it has big implications. But for me, it shows the power and potential of personalized medicine. When I look at you personally, when my team looks at you through what is available and established through science, you know, when this, these are established known scientific uh, tests, validated tests, that we're just not applying. We're not mm -hmm. applying it in traditional medicine because we're not, we're not, thinking in that way, we're not building the system to deliver healthcare in that way, even though we know if we worked in that way, we would be preventing decline, it would be less costly, we would have healthier people and more uh, conscious and, I, and I guarantee happier people. Okay. Yeah. And what's your view on the fact that, of course, it m must be must come at a price uh, to follow your, your treatment? Yeah. Um, well, nothing in healthcare is free. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that we're paying for our healthcare anyway. You know, in the UK, we think we're not paying for our healthcare, but to deliver a healthcare service, it costs. And actually, who pays is the question that you wanna, you wanna ask. Because we're used to reactive healthcare being paid for by an insurance, health insurance, mm -hmm. or, the, yeah. or our tax in the UK, the NHS. Um, and who has the responsibility? And I definitely think that the governments, the Insurance companies should be paying for this type of healthcare. Do you think it's something so. imaginable in the future? It's happen. It's going to happen. You know, I believe it's going. We're putting it out there. It's going to happen. It will happen. It's only a matter of time. The evidence we're building is irrefutable, and it's not just our our, our approach. You know, this there is this approach 
found in America quite frequently in parts of Germany, Austria um, as well. And so there's a lot of evidence being built. We've seen 2,000 patients and we've got, that's a, that's a large amount of data sets to show improvement of quality of life, improvement in biomarkers that we want to get to the point where we're having these discussions. What we need to do is prove the health economics, which is challenging because uh, but it can be, it's, not, it's challenging for me because that's not my background, but it can, it can, it's something that can be solved. And so I don't think we're far off from it. If we look at the US, for example, um, insurance companies are now paying for functional medicine or this approach of testing and looking at you functionally. Um, and the UK, we hope, will follow suit, but, and Europe, but it might take a couple of more years. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, as a doctor, want to be delivering healthcare for free, right? Yeah. To the patient. Yeah. I want everyone okay. to receive this, and that's the desire I want. But the reality is that it's not funded at the moment, and so we are delivering it at the best possible prices that we can. We've built systems to scale expertise internally um, so that, you know, it's, you're able to kind of get it at a more reasonable, democratized price. Um, we're, you know, just, just as these innovations become more established through systems, processes and adoption, then supply and demand will dictate. And, you know, from where we were, you know, our prices are, you know, a fraction of what they were when we first had to start because the cost of delivering them was so much more expensive. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of what, where we're at right now in terms of our pricing. I think it's so fair for the way we okay. price our product. Um, and we deliver a, a remarkable mu amount of value. Um, um, and I'm confident to say that, you know, and, um, and I look at how we price compared to the US. And our health programs are probably a fifth of what the prices on average are in the US. There's okay. a, a different, and these are for fee paying services. Um, and so, um, you know, that's in the, in the UK where there's less supply of kind of experts, et cetera, et cetera. And we often have to work with lab tests companies in the US as well. Okay. So I know, I know, I know, um, yeah. And, and, and what we're, we, our next step is applying technology. Yeah, so that's our next step as a company. So how do we, how do we optimize even further, create more efficiencies uh, to reduce costs even more and to allow the experts to do what they do best, which is just work with the patients, work with the humans, you know, and, um, and free them up from their, their admin. And so that's, that's the next part of our journey that we're hoping to go on. In uh, 20 years, if you imagine yourself like, uh, and you say like, that was a great success, what would you have had achieved? I'm happy. I'm happy that I'm already happy. I'm happy that I get to, to try. Point. I get to yeah. try. I get to, I get to try my best. And th that's what I'm happy with. What happens in 20 years, I'm not sure. And I'm not too worried about. Okay. I could get to 20 years. So and you're not anxious. I know, actually <laughs> not. I could get to 20 years and there could be no human company left and it could be a disaster and I could be, yeah, but I'd be really happy that I tried my best and my team tried their best to get this out to as many people as we could. And so, um, so I, I'm hopeful for the future though. I'm seeing a lot more health professionals engaging, opening their eyes and saying, actually, you know, asking questions like, why are we treating the whole population in the same way? You know, and why can't we get on top of these diseases when I've only got 10, 15 minutes with a patient? Why am I only looking at two markers if they're tired when I know that all of these other systems are involved? And I get, uh, you know, we're growing a health professional community and we're training other health professionals in the principles and the philosophy on how to deliver. And we're taking them on a journey, hopefully, to help them understand how to deliver it on patients. Yeah. And just, just to add to this, you know, there is a massive information asymmetry in the marketplace, you know. Um, there's a lot of health experts who've never worked with patients, who never applied their knowledge to patients. And, there's, and applying the science is medicine on the, and the variability of those results from person to person and the nuances of how to apply it to a 20 year old versus a 30 year old or a 45 year old mm. that's MS and digestive issues versus a 50, a 50 year old, you know. And, and I, think, I think the consumers, I think marketplace is becoming confused you know, with the amount of information overload. And I think that's our big challenge right now is okay. how do we, how do we un cut through that and understand what are the key starting points in that Maslow's hierarchy of need, the key foundations that we need to work on to improve our state. Okay. Yeah.
Wonderful. I'm going to ask you the last question, uh, the one I'm asking to everybody, um, all the guests of uh, Harvest in London. What is uh, your favorite tool to actively transform our uh, society, our planet, or ourselves? Developing state awareness, uh, becoming aware of our physiological, biological state. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that's the starting point. Because once you become aware of yourself more and more and more, then you can start to be in control of yourself. Then you can start to influence. And then ripples turn to waves. And I've seen it time and time again with the people I work with. Yeah. You know? Um, they have an impact on their family, they have an impact on their, their workplace, they have it, and those ripples turn to waves. Thank you very much, Dr. E, Thank for you, uh, this interview and for uh, being uh, with us at Harvest in London. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be part of um, this, this journey with Harvest. It's going to be great. I've got a last question. Um, if I, I will see if I put it inside or not, sure. because it's quite a generic one, but I think it's interesting because we don't talk enough about this. Uh, I see if I can add it. Um, we all want to, uh, you said like some people, some young people bring their parents uh, after coming to your place. Uh, and I think we're all quite concerned in a way about our parents, grandparents. Is there something um, that um, our elderly lack and like any easy stuff like we could uh, tell them to do or a medicine or something for them to take care of them? I think movement, encouraging more and more movement, and um, particularly proximal muscle mass. I think we, yes. don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't talk enough about muscle mass uh, for the elderly. We know yeah. that as their muscles decline, because our rates of muscle loss increases as we get older, so we lose muscle more quickly, yeah. it's harder to build muscle. And as soon as we start to get muscle mass, there's a big focus of ours at the moment, is how, how do we maintain muscle mass in the elderly? And we have technologies and strategies for that, and protein, absorption yes. digestion but also technical Weights. technological strategies okay. we have devices that we can apply for electromagnetic stimulation okay. of muscles to create okay. a strengthening muscles. of those muscles okay. without them having to load the joints do squats for example uh, okay which are very difficult so i think um the trunk trunkal core strength front okay. posterior chain so your hamstrings your glutes are okay. very very important um, and lower back as well as your abdominal strength the other thing to understand is that bones become thinner as well. And we know so many people rapidly deteriorating in their 80s after they have a fracture. Yeah, yeah. yeah? yeah. It's a very common thing. They may be otherwise well, compass mentis, heart's good, you know, everything else is good, but they have a fracture and they have a sudden yeah, decline. Yeah. Okay, so maintaining bone strength is important. And, and how do you do that? It's tough. It is tough. There are technologies. We have a technology called Bone Strong, which compresses the bone. It's okay. a 12-minute treatment uh, once a week for 12 weeks, and it's shown to strengthen the bone, increasing the T-score, improving the T-score, uh, which represents bone density. Okay. Um, so uh, nutritionally, that helps, but there's also kind of women get rapid bone loss during the menopause. Yeah. They age five years in terms of their bone age okay. in the menopause okay. uh, faster than men. So um, it's and very- naturally, how do you take care of your bones when you're old? Um, compressive forces, so you've got to keep doing them when you're from a younger age. Um, so uh, jumps, jumping from a higher distance. So you've got to be doing it from your 50s and 60s and regularly and keeping. That's why the muscle strength is really important. Okay, uh, how gymnasts. do you jump? How do you jump? You jump? So you jump from like maybe four foot high. Okay. And you land like a gymnast. Ah. Okay, so that will give you a long bone strength. Break. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and brace. Obviously, you have to do that. Do this with some a young person, a trainer, or someone that can help you through it. But that's one way to do it naturally. Um, and diet can help as well. Um, and um, but yeah, test. Make sure. Look at your hormones. Maybe go in a short period of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy uh, for women going through the menopause. At that time, that can help prevent uh, bone loss as well. Um, so bone and muscles yeah um, is, is, is important and underspoken Drunk. about in, okay. in, in for the elderly and do you know what the other thing that I often think about is um, how do we re give the elderly more purpose and connect them back to the young you know and how do we erase the importance of that for the young to be learning from the elderly because purpose is so important we learned that from the blue zones how important yeah. purpose is and the elderly having purpose, feeling they have a role, an important role within the structure of society. And I think Western society, we, we don't 
we don't promote the role of the elderly enough yeah. as as leaders within our society, mm. as the potential mm. of being leaders. Yeah, uh, we've got so much to learn from them. Yeah. And you know, they're in the, they, they know, you know, when you get older, you learn how to manage your flow state. They don't get angry as quick, <laughs> often they're not. You know, they, they <laughs> tend to preserve their energy. They know how to do it, right? So, but they, that's because of the vast life experiences. And so I think there's, there, there's something about, we can take all take away from this, uh, right this moment, is think about someone elderly, and I'm thinking of someone right now, um, that we can go to, and help them redefine their purpose. Beautiful. You know, give yeah. them a sense of purpose again, where they feel important, they feel valued, they feel needed. Yeah. Not, not the other way where they feel like they're burden. a yeah. burden. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, I think that will go such a long, long way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoyed that. Okay.